In this lecture, I am going to go over how to write a lab report. And you will need to know this when you write your lab report for the yeast respiration lab that you are doing this week in Intro Bio. Specifically, you will write a lab report on Procedure 12.1, Production of Carbon Dioxide During Anaerobic Fermentation. When you write this lab report, you are only responsible for the following sections. You need to write the introduction, the results section with a figure, and the literature cited sections. This means that you are omitting the methods section. You've already practiced writing a methods section for a different lab, and so we are not going to ask for you to do it here. When you write this lab report, you will do well if you use the lab report guide, which is on Blackboard, as instructions and use the examples therein to help make sure that you are using the proper formatting and style. If you do this, you will probably do very well on this assignment. If you don't, then you probably will not do as well as you hope. So one more reminder, please use the lab report guide. We are going to go over the general setup of a lab report now. So in a lab report, there are several sections. Each section needs to have its own heading. For example, when you wrote your materials and methods section, you had a heading that said either methods or materials and methods. That will be true for the other sections you're doing this time as well. Your first section will be the introduction. And the introduction has two primary parts. The first part is a description of the nature and background of the problem. In other words, you're telling the reader what is already known about the uh, system or the question that we are investigating. And since you're telling the reader about things that are already known, you should cite previous work um, from other scientists in this section. When you write the introduction, the background information must be paraphrased. This means it should be in your own words. You should not use quotes. Generally, in scientific writing, especially lab reports, we never use quotes. When you give the introduction, it doesn't have to be super long. We are probably looking at an introduction that is two or three paragraphs long for this assignment. So give the reader just enough pertinent information to orient the reader. It would be in the discussion section where you would talk about the background in more depth in comparison to your own results. Here's an example of a introduction from a different sort of lab. Loggerhead turtles, Coretta Coretta, are the most common turtle in the Mediterranean Sea and their biology has been described by Miller, 1997. They nest on the eastern basin shores, mainly in Greece. From nesting sites, hatchling move to the open ocean, foraging on the surface, then start a developmental migration towards near shore and continental shelf waters. Sexually mature turtles move to specific mating and nesting sites during the breeding system. What I want you to notice here is first, I gave the name of the organism being studied and I gave its properly formatted scientific name. Notice too that I told you at the very beginning of this paragraph from where I was getting this information. I did not save the citation for the end. Instead, I front loaded it so you would understand that the remaining material from the paragraph was also coming from this source. I gave the author's name as well as the year of publication, and we'll talk more about the specific arrangement of this information um, in a subsequent slide. Notice too that this is all in my own words. None of these sentences are direct quotes from Miller. The second part of the introduction. Here is where you are going to state the objectives of your study. 
So you're transitioning from what's already known to what do you seek to find out in your own work? So in this section, you are going to explicitly state the purpose of our study. And you will state a question, probably a general question that you are asking, as well as more specific hypotheses being tested. And if you have done all of this, then the second part of your introduction is going to concisely state why you are performing the investigation. Now, relevant to the specific study you're doing here with respiration, it's a complex study. You're not just testing one hypothesis. Instead, you are testing multiple different hypotheses. This means that you will have multiple different hypothesis statements in your introductory paragraph, in that second paragraph talking about the purpose of your study. In the introduction, you can give a very brief one sentence overview of the approach you are using, but you will not describe the methods in detail because that information belongs in the methods section. Remember that you are not actually writing the methods section for this lab report. So just sort of imagine that you did, and then you are gonna move on directly to the results section. This is where you present your own data and statistics relevant to your data. There are two general parts to this. First is the narrative or the body. And this is going to be a simple um, to the point explanation of exactly what you found. You will also refer to either figures or tables. And for the respiration lab report, we request that you include a figure of your results. So it will be a figure in this case. In that paragraph that you're writing, the goal is to explain the figure and present any relevant data that is not represented in figures or tables. Remember that the reader is looking at the figure and so they already know the exact values or at least a good estimate of the exact values that you measured. That means when you write this paragraph, do not repeat specific data points. For example, do not tell me that one of the bar heights was 12.6 millimeters tall. I will see that in the figure. So simply tell me whether the bar was taller or shorter than other bars to which you are comparing it. The body of your results is a narrative, and so it needs to be written in coherent paragraph form. The first sentence should give us some idea of what's coming, as well as contain pertinent information. And all of the other sentences should have substantive information the reader needs to know. You need to report any statistical analyses. For our purposes, this is going to mean statements of what differences are statistically significant. And implicitly, which ones also are not statistically significant. In the results section, you are not going to do any interpretation. Interpreting your results would belong in the discussion section which would come after the results. So here you are just very concisely telling us what you found. You're not telling us anything about what it means or whether the results were expected or unexpected. For this particular lab, you are going to imagine that you have written a results or a discussion section and that you explained the meaning and interpretation of the results there. We will not actually ask you to write that section for this lab. Um, but that is where the information would go if you were doing so. In the results, do not describe the methods. Again, that information would have gone in the materials and methods section. 
do not tell us anything subjective about your data. For example, don't tell us whether your result was good. Don't tell us whether your result was unexpected or not real. Simply state what you found. You could, in the discussion section, tell us something about your interpretation of the quality of the results if you were writing that section. When you rate your results for the respiration study you're doing this week, you should explain your results in a structure that parallels your hypotheses. This will make it easy for the reader to follow. So what does this mean? Imagine that in the introduction, you hypothesized that treatment A would increase the rate of fermentation relative to treatment B. If you made that hypothesis, whatever A and B are, then in the results, you would need to have a sentence that indicates whether in fact A did increase the respiration rate relative to B. And if it did, you would also need to specify whether the difference between the two groups was large enough that it was statistically significant. This term will appear a lot. Sentences will typically say, there was a difference between A and B, and it was statistically significant, or the difference between A and B was in the direction hypothesized. However, the difference was not statistically significant. And you are going to repeat a statement like this for each of your hypotheses. It's okay if the writing is boring. Um, you don't get bonus points for changing sentence structure. Just make it really easy to follow and as similar to the actual hypotheses as possible. After the results section would be the discussion, but you are not responsible for writing a discussion for this week's lab. So instead, um, you are going to go directly on to your literature cited section. The literature cited is where you list all of the scientific articles or books that you actually referred to in the body of your lab report. So anything that you mentioned in the introduction or discussion. Here are some general rules for literature cited. First, you can only cite scientific journals and books. You are not allowed to cite websites unless your instructor specifically allows you to do so, and you should not need to for this particular lab report. So if you got information from Infectious Bite at blogspot.com about vampire respiration, it might be interesting and even useful but you are not allowed to cite it in your lab report or in your literature cited section. You also cannot use popular press magazines. So these are magazines written for the general public, not for scientists specifically, such as Newsweek or Time or Discover magazine. You are only allowed to put in your literature cited section articles that you have actually referenced in the body of your report. So going back to that sample introduction that we looked at way back here, we explicitly referred to re um, something that Miller 1997 said. That means Miller 1997 will have to appear somewhere in our literature cited section. If you simply read background on something, but you do not use that information explicitly in your lab report, then it needs to be omitted from your literature cited section. The citations have a specific format, and the format is described in detail in the lab report guide. I will briefly go over it here, but please refer to the lab report guide for details. The citations need to be in alphabetical order by the last name of the first author. And the first author is whichever one is listed first in the publication itself. You don't get to move around author names. The order of names is decided based on who did the most work. So you need to keep those names in the same order 
as the article in which they are published. You need to list all author names in the literature cited section. This is different than what you'll actually do in the body of your um, introduction, and we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But for this section, if there are six authors, you need to list all six. If there are seven, you need to list all seven. After seven, we start to make exceptions to this, but it will not be relevant for this particular lab report. And so here is an example literature cited section. You can see some of these articles have only one author, but this one has two, and they are both listed. Most of your information will come from scientific articles, and the format for those are as follows. Names of authors, such as shown here, last name first, for the first author, comma, initials, and then after the first author, we switch the order, initials first, followed by last name. The final author, we put an and before their name, then their first initial, their last name, and then the period. After the period comes the year of publication, for example, 2000. Then comes the article title. Notice only proper nouns plus the first word are capitalized. So anti-predator is capitalized. All of the other words are lowercase, except for the proper noun, which is the genus. And remember, scientific names are always capital lowercase, capital first, lowercase second, and italicized. That same rule holds even if it's in the title of an article. After the article title, we get a period, and then the journal title. The journal title gets italicized, and all of the important words are capitalized here. We don't capitalize articles or prepositions. Then we get a period. We have the volume of publication, followed by a colon, followed by the page numbers. Again, to get that information in a easier format, find it in the lab report guide. For a book, we are going to do authors, followed by period, followed by year period, book title, which is capitalized except prepositions and articles, period, the location of publication, colon, the name of the publisher. Now let's go back and talk about how you will cite information in the actual text of the lab report. For example, Let's go back to our sentence that referred to Miller 1997 in the introduction. The most usual way of doing this is simply by paraphrasing the information in your own words in the sentence, and then after the sentence, putting a parenthesis, and then the name of the author or authors followed by the year. Alternatively, you can include the author in the actual body of the sentence. If you do that, then following the author or authors, you need to include the year of publication. For example, let's just move this up. Miller parentheses 1997 parentheses explains dot 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 the rest of the information. So you can see here that since we used Miller's name in the sentence, we only put the year of publication in parentheses and it goes immediately after the author's name. What if there are two authors? If there are two authors, then you are going to include both of their last names in the in-text citation. As shown here, we have Inoue and Makita, space 1996. What if there are three or more authors? In this case, we no longer list all of their names in the text of the writing. We still would in the literature cited section. But in the text, we list only the first one, followed by the Latin phrase et al. Et al is Latin for and others. And 
so we are implicitly acknowledging all of the authors. We're saying that there's more than one, but we're only listing the name of the first one. Because this is Latin, we will italicize it. And because AL is an abbreviation, we put a period after it. Et, ET is not an abbreviation. It's Latin for and. And so we do not put a period after that. For this particular lab report, you need to cite the articles that we provide for you on Blackboard plus your lab book. When you write scientific names, remember that the first word is the genus. It is capitalized and italicized. The second word is the species epithet. It is lowercase but italicized. You will need to include the name of the yeast we are using as part of your lab report. The next rule varies by discipline. In some subjects, um, such as some parts of chemistry, they would give you exactly the opposite advice. And so this is always a good question to ask your instructor in a new course. But for our purposes in introductory biology, we want you to always use the active voice. Remember from English that the active voice is one where the subject of the sentence then does an action. So, for example, if you were writing about um, doing something medical, you would write, I examined patients. That is the active voice. The passive voice would be, examination of patients was accomplished by me. Here, the subject that's actually doing the work is in the second half of the sentence. That's passive. In active, the subject doing the work is at the start of the sentence. You have already seen that I am picky about grammar and style as well as mechanics. So carefully proofread your lab report after you've written it. It is always easier to catch somebody else's mistakes. So after you have completed writing a draft of your lab report and after your classmate has already done so, then I suggest exchanging papers and commenting on each other's writing. I ask you not to exchange papers or let anyone else read your draft unless you have confirmed that they have already finished writing theirs. This is to prevent them from plagiarizing you because if they plagiarize you, both of you can end up in trouble since it is hard for us to determine who was the original writer and who was the plagiarizer. So it is allowed and even encouraged to review each other's work, but do it after everybody has completed their initial draft. You should turn in your lab report as one single document on Blackboard, all in one. This means making your graph in Excel and then pasting your graph into the Word document. then upload that entire document to Blackboard. It needs to be double-spaced with 12-point font, such as Arial or Colibri. Whatever the default font is on your board processor will be okay with me. This is an explicit reminder that plagiarism is not allowed. And there's a statement about this in the USC Upstate Code of Student Conduct. So students caught plagiarizing materials in lab reports will be submitted for disciplinary action as outlined in that code of student conduct. This could be plagiarizing from a published source, such as by using somebody else's words without putting them in quotes, or by paraphrasing somebody else's ideas without giving a um, reference for where those ideas came from. We will use plagiarism checking software on Blackboard. And this is one way that we can detect plagiarism. We can also detect it simply by 
recognizing ourselves that there are um, similarities between reports that cannot be explained simply by the shared assignment. I will reduce scores on late lab reports by 10% per day. So if it's about a 30 point assignment, you would lose about three points per day. Um, instead of winning to the last minute, please plan ahead for complications. And one more reminder, in our lab next week, we will be studying photosynthesis. Um, whether or not there is a quiz scheduled, we are always allowed to give pop quizzes. So you should review your respiration notes prior to lab next week. And in the background there, that is my cat, Simony.